Welcome to the Pain Live Peer Exchange editorial video series, Chronic Pain Update 2013. New data and perspectives on assessing, diagnosing, and managing chronic pain. I'm Dr. Peter Salgo. I'm a professor of medicine and anesthesiology at Columbia University and an associate director of surgical intensive care at New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York. Severe chronic pain affects more than 100 million Americans each year which is more than cancer, heart disease, and diabetes combined. Despite this, studies show that pain is still all too frequently undertreated due to a number of barriers limiting access to adequate pain care. One barrier is the lack of formal training in pain management received by the majority of primary care physicians and non-pain specialists that provide the bulk of pain care in the United States. That is why it's imperative that frontline practitioners have access to resources that provide practical insights from experts that can be used in clinical practice to provide better care to patients suffering with chronic pain. Well, I've got the privilege of moderating today's discussion where we'll focus on key topics in the assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of a range of chronic pain types, providing specific information and insight to meet the needs of pain management specialists, primary care physicians, and other clinicians who are involved in the management of patients with chronic pain. For today's discussion, I'm joined by some leading experts with a wide range of experience in pain management. Christopher Garibo, MD, Medical Director of Pain Medicine, Hospital for Joint Diseases, NYU Langone Medical Center, Associate Professor of Anesthesiology and Orthopedics, NYU School of Medicine. Jeffrey A. Gooden, MD, Clinical Instructor, Anesthesiology, Mount Sinai University School of Medicine, Director, Pain and Palliative Care, Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, Englewood, New Jersey. Joseph Pergolisi, MD, Adjunct Assistant Professor, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Naples Anesthesia and Physician Associates Group, Naples, Florida. And joining us remotely, Charles E. Argoff, MD, Professor of Neurology, Albany Medical College, Director, Comprehensive Pain Center, Albany Medical Center. Opioid medications are an important component of comprehensive pain treatment and are among the most prescribed medications in the country. New data on the safety and efficacy of long-term chronic opioid therapy, along with growing concerns over the abuse, misuse, and diversion of these medications, has prompted a renewed dialogue on the appropriate use of opioids in practice. We're going to discuss the use of these medications to treat a range of painful conditions, best practices in selecting patients for opioid therapy, and managing risk during treatment and the latest educational measures for clinicians and patients designed to curb the abuse, the misuse, and the diversion of opioid medications. Well, thank you all for joining us today, and I guess what we want to do now is get started. So, we want to talk first about legal and regulatory reaction to public concerns over the prescription of opioid abuse, which is something very big in pain management, Joe. Um, what do you think? is the single most useful component of the opioid REMS program, which is a continuing education program for providers and patient counseling resources, medical guides, for reducing the misprescribing, the misuse, and the abuse of ER um, LA opioids. Peter, I think that one of the key elements to the risk evaluation mitigation strategy for long-acting opioids is the medication guide and the patient component. And I don't think we can do enough when it comes to educating our po patients about proper, uh, safe, and appropriate use of long-acting opioids. So that's part of the REMS program, right? Is there, is there, a, is there a type of physician that, that tends to benefit most, do you think? I think, uh, you know, everyone benefits from REMS. That's the uh, hope, at least, that the FDA has in place. And um, I think individuals uh, who may be in the primary care arena will benefit uh, more, in, at least incrementally, from REMS. But you know, the, the thing about REMS programs, we can all join in on this, is that they're voluntary, right? They're not regulatory, at least not yet. And does the fact that they're voluntary actually mitigate against their success? What do you all think? Well, you know, Peter, it's been mandated on the pharma companies to, uh, to enact these programs. But, uh, but you're right, it is voluntary to physicians. So one of the most important things, and I, I agree with Joe, is, is patient education. Uh, not only do they get a medication guide when they go to the pharmacy now to fill certain types of long-acting opioid medications, but it's become uh, uh, inherent on us to educate patients about the safe use of those medications as well. But I want to come back to docs. Now, I know where I work that I would say every 35 microseconds, I get asked to do some online course, which is regulatory for me, for reappointment where I work. Um, 
So the question is, I guess, twofold. It's not regulatory right now for physicians, but if it were, would it make a difference? I think there's growing recognition that um, we're not educated enough, especially the non-pain specialist just doesn't know enough about non-opioids and opioids and how to incorporate them. So I believe that it should be mandatory. And that's where some states are sort of pondering right now. Well, I got a question for Dr. Argoff. What's your opinion on, on laws such as Rhode Island's requirement that health practitioners must obtain a patient history, perform a patient evaluation, or, or examine a patient uh, prior to prescribing a controlled substance? So, not wanting to sound like... Um, oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a, a almost 12-year-old daughter who would say, duh, in response to that. I cannot believe that a healthcare provider, and specifically a physician, would have to be told, or by mandated law, to do what that person learned probably the first month of medical school, um, or shortly thereafter is the foundation of ta taking care of a human being. Um, I told you it was softball. Um, it is be, it's just an atrocity of a sort um, that a law would have to be passed to tell a physician to do what a physician was t was should have learned many, many, many years ago. You know, um, I, 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 I take care of many people, though, having said that, who have never been examined by their provider. It's, it's, it's sort of like that book, you know, everything you needed to learn, you learned in first grade or kindergarten. All I, needed, all I ever needed to learn, I learned in kindergarten. Be, be nice, thing. play fair, very simple things. If you turn it on, turn it off, open the door, close the door. If you're going to prescribe something, examine the patient and talk to How the How could you know what to do for someone without understanding who, you know, we have, this is not like rocket science, um, and it's not new. Uh, Sir William Osler, over approximately 100 years ago, and I'm paraphrasing his quote, mentioned um, that it was more important to know who the person is that you're treating than the condition that that person has. I think we can all agree with that. That's, as he called it, a, a dough moment, you know, sort of a Homer Simpson moment. Yeah? I think we need to expand beyond that. It needs to be beyond just the history and the physical. It needs to be how to incorporate a multimodal, a multi-mechanistic plan that's part of a rational pharmacotherapy that serves to improve patients' function. So I think they need to take a step beyond how to make a chronic pain diagnosis and how to go about improving the patient's life functionally. I think also, Peter, what we may have overlooked in the past is an exit strategy. What do you mean by exit track? Meaning when might it be appropriate to consider tapering a patient off opioids if they no longer need it? So I think having uh, appropriate expectations and a compliance monitoring program that would allow us to figure out what's best for the patient and whether or not they still need to use long-acting opioids is appropriate. One other thing too, there are other risk um, evaluation mitigation strategies out there for other drugs um, and the uh, uh, rapid onset opioids have their own uh, REMS program, which is not voluntary. So I think, in my opinion, is it's better to have it voluntary um, and promote it from the educational standpoint as opposed to mandate. So the two of you disagree, at least slightly. In a, in a sense. I mean, I think 100% with Chris that we definitely need to increase um, our knowledge base, uh, especially across the various disciplines. But at the same time, I think we all do have uh, medical degrees. And maybe more emphasis should be placed in medical training um, as opposed to having um, state boards uh, have mandatory uh, type of programs for physicians. You know, you said something, and I'd like you all to, if you would, join me on this one. Um, when you talk about stopping pain medication when they're no longer necessary, tapering off, I mean, people sit up and take notice. Oh my gosh, you know, you're going to take away our pain meds. But isn't that standard practice in medicine for lots of drugs? You stop antibiotics when they're no longer necessary. I tape, taper people off of pressors when they don't need them anymore. Why is there such a, a different spin on, on pain medications? You know, it, it's amazing that you put it in that light. And that's how I speak to my patients nowadays. Anytime I, that I start an opioid, I always tell them, hey, this is like any other medication. We're going to start it. We're going to give it a trial. We'll escalate the doses. We call it a titration phase. But if you don't improve significantly from not just an analgesic standpoint, but like Dr. Grebo says, from a functional standpoint, this is not a medicine that you're going to stay on long term. And I think when we, when we kind of uh, phrase it in that light, patients understand that, hey, like any other medication, I might go on 
or off this. Whereas in the past, opioids were a never-ending ceiling. We would just start them and, and have no exit strategy, as, as Joe mentioned. Uh, you know, state